So what recovery process looks like? You connect the drive, you do drive diagnostics, you optimize imaging parameters based on trial and error, if necessary, again, right? We can use still default configuration, or you can play with different types of resets, different types of read block sizes, all the parameters that I mentioned, okay? You just play and see if it works better. Uh, <clears throat> and then you image the file system metadata so if you use DRE, Deep Spy Recovery Environment, it will do it automatically. So it will find partition, you select partition, and it will find metadata. I'm referring to file attributes, right? All file tables, either catalog for HFS or MFT table for NTFS. And it will, it will do it automatically. And then it, it builds you the file tree, okay? You review the file tree and, uh, uh, and mark all files that you need to recover, okay? So basically your client is looking for specific files, you just reuse regular search, it will mark those files, and, uh, and it will just uh, uh, image only those sectors that belong to, uh, to selected uh, files in, in one batch. Okay, so uh, not like going like crazy fragments, one fragment, another fragment, another far fragment, no. You will select files, it will mark all the, all the fragments that belong to those files in, in the map, and then it, do, it does irregular imaging, linear imaging, from LBA0 to maximum LBA, maybe even head-by-head -head imaging, okay? But only areas that belongs to your files, okay? So it's quite complex uh, uh, scenario. <clears throat> and then you verify integrity of recovered files, and try re-imaging something if, if, it, if it's needed, okay? So pretty straightforward process, as you can see. Just, just common sense, <clears throat> okay? And now the last level uh, is handling drive level issues, okay? So I, once again, to remind you where we were, we were talking about software recoveries, what could be done, right? Moving to the next step would be to handle disk level issues, right? To handle read instability problems, and now, if you still want to go further, okay, what kind of tools you may need to actually do, uh, to handle drive level issues? <clears throat> well, first of all, it's, uh, it's issues that, uh, that is resulting from damaged read write heads, so disk platters, so completely failed heads, uh, or mechanical issues when something is not even moving inside the drive, or electric, uh, electronic issues when the board or PCB is, is burnt, or CPU or motor control or something on the board is burnt, uh, or it's a critical firmware corruption when the drive doesn't even boot up properly, it's not initialized, and, it's, and that's not, don't respond. <clears throat> and so we are talking about failed drives that are not capable of initializing at all. <clears throat> And tool that needed, it's a drive level issues, it's, it's a combination of advanced equipment. I can't really even say, you know, like, uh, better than that. It, it's really, uh, as soon as we're talking about a failed drive, there could be lots and lots of uh, tools that, that may be needed, okay, for you to repair the drive. What you should keep in mind is that there are no other way of recovering data from failed drive rather than repair the drive. Okay, so what I mean is, it's not, it's not, it's common sense, but uh, you may uh, find uh, in many marketing materials, you know, things like, uh, like magic tools when you can take, when you take this platter out of hard drive, plug it in, you know, like a CD-ROM, like, and it will read data, you know. So, so these tools cannot be built. Okay, trust me on that. So the only way to recover data from failed drive is to repair the drive. You have to repair the drive, that's it. And you repair the drive uh, to uh, the, this, this, uh, this uh, state when you can process with a hardware imager, okay? So when it somehow start leaving, okay? And then you connect it to hardware imager and then process all, all disk level issues. But most drives that has drive level issues do have disk level issues. Okay, most drives. Because most drives are those drives that were killed by system software <laughs> or other previous, re previous recovery attempt. Okay, so uh, very rare when the drive fails like this. Okay, no. 
there is obviously uh, all the time there is some certain degradation, some certain problems, and then it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until it dies. Okay? So when you find the cause of that complete failure and repair it, you will still be facing disk level issues because now you will get back right prior to it failed. Okay? You will get back to the drive when it's just, it, at that point it failed, and now it's not, so you have to now use hardware imager to process all those disk level issues that were not processed properly by system software, okay? or whatever tools uh, <coughs> you were using. So what uh, tools uh, like okay, uh, for drive level issues? It's a PCB repair, or again, board repair tools. It's just a regular electronics measurement equipment, soldering station, and everything you can think of that, that can repair electronics, right? Uh, then vendor-specific firmware diagnostic and repair tools. That's, uh, that is quite a, quite a large part of tools that have been used in, in, in professional data recovery industry because, again, when the drive fails, one of the critical firmware modules can fail, okay? And then you need vendor-specific tools like PC3000, for example, to get access to firmware and to repair firmware, okay? So that's another kind of uh, <coughs> uh, set of tools that uh, PDR is using. Uh, had uh, and platter replacement tools, obviously, right? So this is something that, that you will use uh, in, a, in a clean room environment, uh, like head comps or different workbenches when you put uh, the bad drive, a donut drive, and transplant something from one drive to another. So different kind of mechanical tools, it just helps you, okay, to, to, do, to do mechanical replacement properly. Stock donor drives and, and boards uh, for drive diagnostic and repair. Uh, if this is a donor drive, uh, uh, we, we're running off the timer. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Okay. So, uh, stock of donor drives. Uh, obviously, if if you have any mechanical uh, parts or, or read write uh, head that failed, right, you will need a donor donor part, right? You will need a donor drive to uh, do a swap. But it's not just for repairing. It's for diagnostic also. Because, uh, for example, if this is electronic failure, you may need to have a donor stock of PCBs just to just to try it out and 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 to to do proper diagnostic. And then class 100 clean air equipment. Uh, such a desktop airflow bench, right? So don't think that, you know, clean room is actually room. You know, most professional data recovery companies are using desktop airflow benches. So it's basically benches sitting on your desk, okay? And it just creates some kind of airflow so that no dust is going inside of the bench, okay? So it's basically just a filter, and it's just, just some airflow, Okay, and then you are doing inside of this bench, you're doing whatever you're doing, but you know that no dust is coming in. So it's not really very expensive equipment, by the way. You can, you can buy something like for $2,000, the new, uh, you know, good uh, clean room uh, bench. But, but again, this is, uh, this is not a solution for the problem, right? It just, it's just something that you may need if you decide to start swapping parts. Swapping part, that what, what is uh, kind of more complex uh, procedure than just having a clean room. <clears throat> okay, problem with electronics. Uh, it's uh, diagnostics, uh, usually it's a visual inspection, so I also recommend you when you have a drive, just do visual inspection. If some of the chips burned out, you will see that it burned out. Okay, so it's just visually burned. And uh, uh, current monitor, that's the one that I mentioned for DTI, it gives a very good diagnostic to identify, uh, for instance, uh, um, burned fuse, okay? And this burned fuse is, is, real, uh, is, is very easy repairable, so you can just uh, uh, solder a piece of wire on top of the fuse, it's just regular fuse. Uh, or uh, the, some, uh, some drive has so-called TVS diet. It's a short of TVS diet, and then in this case, it's, a, it's a also a circuitry protection, okay? It's a power protection circuitry, okay, that fails. It's like a fuse, but uh, vice versa. So, so if this is TVS diet, it has to be uh, uh, unsoldered, okay? So, so uh, basically, uh, with, the, with the boards, all, uh, all that recovery companies, what they're doing, they're 
usually swapping PCBs. Okay, so they don't bother with trying to find the right uh, the component that failed. They swap swap the board. But the critical thing that you should know about swapping the board that this ROM chip should also be swapped. And this is what IT industry is doing wrong. Okay, there is nothing wrong with swapping boards. The only problem with it is, if you swap the board, you have move the chip ROM chip from original board to the donor board, okay? Why? Because all modern drives, all modern drives, during the manufacturing testing procedures, uh, identify parameters that should be used by the drive. It's like a tune-up, you know, fine tune-up. What, what, what the level of current, writing current, what the amplification level should be, all those different, you know, what pulse of the voice call actuator to move the head. So all these parameters are being diagnosed and burned to ROM on the board, okay? So the most common pro uh, mistake that people do, they're swapping the board and see if it works. And, and pretty much for all drives, all modern drives, it will never work. Okay, so if you're considering swap, trying to swap board, nothing bad about it. I recommend it. If you have a donor board, it's not a problem. But you have to move that uh, uh, ROM chip. Now, how to find this ROM chip? How to find it? Um, for all drives, pretty much all drives, it's a small eight pins chip. Okay, so it's a small chip with eight pins. Okay, four and four. And then. Uh, I can give you advice. It's a perfect tool to identify ROM chip is Google. <laughs> OK? So what you do, you take the board and, and just type in to Google label that you see on each 8-pin chip and see the content. You don't even have to find data, data sheet of this chip. You will see, right, this is flash, memory, ROM, whatever, you know, keywords are. But you will know if this is a ROM, this is a chip you need to move. OK? So that's, uh, that's, that's the thing that you should know. I, I really, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's not risky process to swap the board. Uh, the risky process is to swap the board without moving ROM. OK? So that's why it's, uh, it's kind of you know, a good thing that you can really try. But if, if you have current monitor for DDI, you can identify also burn fuse and repair the board if you want. Oh, yeah? What, what, uh, oh, oh, at 5? Already? OK. So I'm pretty much finished, but we have now a lab session. OK? So we are moving. We, we're, we'll take everything to the book and we'll try to lab over there, I guess. OK. Okay.